That morning, Dallaire sent Belgian and Ghanaian peacekeepers to guard Madame Agath, the moderate prime minister. Then he went to find the extremist leadership. Agathe was getting all the, the protection she needed, uh, at least the, 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 we, we expected. We needed, I mean, they were, ended up by having 25 troops there. With that sort of in hand, my job now, because I was moving around, uh, is to go get a hold of Bagasora and say, well, okay, what's going on now? What is the situation? Roadblocks were coming up. Uh, but as I got closer to the inner core of the city, the roadblocks became more serious, and ultimately the roadblocks in that inner circle there was controlled by the presidential guard. And so uh, we made our way to the Ministry of Defense. Uh, nobody was there. Uh, and uh, so I said, well, maybe they're right back to where they were last night. So just turned and went towards the ESM. As Dallaire looked for the extremist leaders, the prime minister's house was surrounded by Rwandan troops. Inside, UN peacekeepers sent to protect her were under orders not to use force. The prime minister called her neighbor, American diplomat Joyce Leader. About 8.30 in the morning, uh, she called and asked if she could come and hide in my house. The prime minister. The prime minister. And I didn't give it very much thought, and I said yes. But then when the Ghanaian peacekeeper who was guarding her, um, he must have put a ladder up on her side of the fence, and he came up above the, he raised his head above the fence, and there were shots fired just then. Rwandan troops stormed the prime minister's compound. The peacekeepers radioed for instructions from Dallaire's Ghanaian deputy. We were in communication with them all along, and it was not even rational for them to try to oppose them. The best they could do was to talk to them, to negotiate, to tell them, look, what you're about to do is wrong. You cannot do it. At gunpoint, the UN troops surrendered their weapons to the Rwandans. The Ghanaian peacekeepers were soon released, but the 10 Belgian troops were taken hostage and led away. The radios became silent. Then you suspected something had gone wrong because communication was suddenly cut off. Then you sense danger. Something must have happened. About an, another half hour later, we actually heard a scream and a shot and realized that it was the prime minister who had been found and killed. General Dallaire hadn't heard of the attack, but he'd learned the extremist leadership was meeting at army headquarters. As he approached, Dallaire caught a glimpse of his soldiers inside the army compound, lying in the dirt. And at the gate, as we went by, I saw two soldiers in a Belgian uniform lying on the ground about 50 odd meters inside, inside the camp. And so your whole life is dependent on those nanoseconds of taking that right decisions because it's life and death. I was already saying, I can't get those guys out of there. I just don't have the forces or the deployment capability. I've got so many other troops that I don't know of and all the vulnerability of the rest. I can't take these bastards on. To do anything for them and for the others, I had to negotiate. Dallaire carried on through the next gate to confront the extremist leadership. But he decided not to mention his troops, who he knew were being beaten 200 yards away. What I said was, get a grip of your units. I'm staying.
The informant, Jean-Pierre, had told us that they were trying to set up to wipe out a dozen or so or 10 Belgians in order to break the back of our mission because if the Belgians pulled out, I had no real substantive capability to sustain myself and that the international community would pull us all out. These guys knew about Mogadishu also. And so uh, what I was making clear to them was is that I'm staying. Dallaire later demanded to know what had happened to the Belgians, but he took no military action to rescue his troops. Finally, uh, a phone call after insistence uh, came and said that they are all at the hospital, uh, at the morgue. And so I said, right, let's go. The morgue was a little shack uh, and a bit of an L-shaped small shack. And it was a 25-watt bulb at best. And there in the corner of the L shape was this pile of potato bags. Just looked like a pile of potato, big, big, huge potato bags. And as we got closer, we, we saw that they were bodies. In the wake of Somalia, the murder of more Western peacekeepers triggered an immediate response. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to start with the situation in Rwanda. Uh, the president called the Secretary of State uh, this morning to express uh, the president's concern about the safety of Americans in Rwanda uh, in light of the deteriorating situation there. By that morning, we kind of had a sense that we were not going to be able to wait this out. I took our wedding album, uh, we took our guns, and um, put the dog at our feet, and literally slumped down in the car, and drove down the streets, like just looking over the dashboard, you know, as we hear fire in the background, and made it to the embassy. The Clinton administration ordered an immediate evacuation of all 257 U.S. citizens in Rwanda. It was up to Laura Lane to get every American out alive. We said we have to, you know, evacuate the American community out because we couldn't risk, you know, their lives um, trying to wait this out because if this was a plan, it had a larger purpose, and that larger purpose would not be good where you'd want anyone in harm's way. But Lane told Washington she wanted to stay and keep the embassy open as a safe haven for Rwandans. I felt very, very strongly that if there is someone who is planning this kind of evil, they need to know that there is also another group that we, the Americans, will stand right here and stand against them. And I felt very, very strongly about that because otherwise they think they could get away with it. Yeah, I, I do recall there, there was the, the notion that yes, maybe we could stay behind and maybe we could do something. But then you have to say, with what do you create a safe haven? If the Belgian troops could not defend and protect um, the Prime Minister from a ruthless attack, uh, what were unarmed Americans bearing a flag going to do? Maybe hopelessly naive. I mean, we are four people in an embassy, and very small embassy community. But, I don't know, I, I think one person can make a difference. And maybe if we just saved one life, that was one life worth saving. Maybe we couldn't save everyone, but I would have rather stood there and said, and, and stayed and said, I am going to stay because it is worth that risk. So, in the end, the decision was taken out of my hands. All embassies in Kigali closed. Aid workers and diplomats were ordered out of the country.